so in in one minute i think uh, we need to be starting so thank you and i give back uh, el can i continue i give back the mic Are we ready to start? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I just wanted to let you know the closed captions are not yet working in Zoom. I will post an external site where people can view the closed captions in the chat and I will continue trying to get the Zoom embedded. Thank you. So should we start? Yes, yes, please. Come on, yeah. Thank you. So um, I wish to welcome you all to the session uh, number 139. Um, session 139, 139, tra track, track inclusion. Thank you to the organizers of uh, Internet Governance Forum 2020. And thank you to the organizers of this session to be here. And this is uh, also a very interesting format. So thank you that everyone was here um, uh, on time with the software and the hardware and the connection limitations. My name is Kamala Netra, Kamala Netra Hun. I am the on-site moderator. In this session, we'll be, we'll be, uh, we will be discussing copyleft uh, or right, mediating interest in academic databases. The format of this session is a simulation game or role play. And the speakers, they come from different backgrounds in geographic origin and gender. And the speakers will role play uh, different stakeholders. And we have uh, four uh, stakeholders, uh, youth, civil society, government, and corporate sector. The parties are real world people. Uh, they are real wor uh, world uh, persons who are involved in academic databases. And uh, there will be a section of interventions to uh, policy questions. Policy questions, I will introduce them uh, at some point. And at the end of this uh, session, the answers will be part of a symbolic resolution, uh, a, symbol, a symbolic re resolution agreement between the parties. Okay, so let me uh, start a little bit of giving context of this session. The Sustainable Development Goals SDGs are part of the resolution 70-1 of the United Nations General Assembly. There are two SDGs in the frame of this session. The first SDG that we are um, that we have as a frame is uh, quality of education, SDG number four, and the other is SDG number nine, which is innovation and infrastructure. Sustainable Development Goal calls for the inclusive and equitable quality of education and the promotion of lifelong learning opportunities for all. Sustainable Development Goal 9 frames build resilient infrastructures, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. So in terms of communication infrastructure, more than half of the world population is now online. And almost the entire world population lives in an area covered by a mobile network. However, many developing countries still lack basic infrastructure. 
to reach quality education and literacy. This is where the SDG 9 and uh, the SDG 9 and SDG 4 meet. And yes, the pandemic COVID-19 situation is happening worldwide, but the education hasn't stopped, no? So how do we achieve uh, sustainability and quality? In this situation, we need to address uh, the, the distance uh, that um, is separating people and infrastru infrastructures should also be transformed in this uh, new digital context. This is a situation that affects not only uh, academic students in universities, but also civil, civil society. The optimization of distribution access and use of scientific data and the optimization of inclusive infrastructure deserves our attention and this is why we are here today. Please let me give you a little bit more of context about um, the relevance of this uh, problematic and internet governance. So Intellectual property was profoundly affected by popularization of the internet. Distribution and access were greatly facilitated, but this also came with illegal utilization of protected work. Number two, open or inexpensive access uh, public policies appear as a two-side solution. So the solution, um, uh, both uh, do both two things. It harnesses the potential of the internet to provide access to knowledge for regions and groups that historically did not have uh, access, but also provide alternatives to paid services, making piracy less attractive. And the third point uh, regarding the relevance of internet governance with this uh, topic is that uh, public policy requires to be developed in a way that does not dismotivate creators and researchers while allowing their works to impact as many people as possible. Uh, and multi, a multi-stakeholder approach is needed, promoting dialogue between uh, database owners, publishers, university and civil society with government intermediation. So this uh, pretty much tell us why we are here and we are doing uh, this, this role play with different uh, stakeholders. So from the, from the perspective of the youth and students and young academics, uh, the COVID-19 uh, has, sh has shown, has, has made it more accurate, more intense, more acute, sorry, why this discussion is important. Um, for the students, the use of online sources was not possible during this time. Uh, universities and libraries have been locked down. And students, like everyone else, could not, uh, could not leave their homes for their health. But still urged to complete their research, dissertation and thesis. Furthermore, most ac academic institutions, in particular in developing institutions in developing countries, lack access to rich academic databases. And one of the reasons why they lack, um, uh, why, they, why they don't, uh, they struggle is because of high prices or the intellectual property rights of companies. Uh, but uh, open access is not only a topic uh, uh, that is important to academic students to complete their research, uh, but it's also uh, important uh, to civic, so to civic uh, science and to, to civic society. Cognitive, uh, cognitive justice, uh, I want to, to coin a definition by the Open and Collaborative Science in Development Network, it's called OCSDNet. And this, um, 
and they have this network has come to a definition I find important. Uh, cognitive justice uh, considers that all individuals and communities, regardless of the culture, gender, socioeconomic status, or language, should be able to fully exercise their capabilities to use, share, and, and create knowledge. It recognizes the diversity of ways of knowing and plurality of knowledge and fosters the interaction of diverse knowledge traditions. Uh, also very important to the topic of sustainable development is to address uh, that knowledge is situated. Um, situated openness is a, is a concept that assumes that knowledge is situated within a particular historical, political, and sociocultural relations. It addresses inequalities and hierarchies of knowledge production. Uh, for example, historically, the social function of the commons was especially important for women who having less title to land and less social power were more dependent on the commons for their subsistence, autonomy and, and sociality. This is a quote from Silvia Federici. Um, wrapping up the Sustainable Development Goal 9, uh, aims to uh, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Civic science uh, fosters innovation and the participation of civil society as actors in the, knowledge pro in the knowledge production and the sustainable development of their communities. So with this, I want to clarify that uh, that is, um, that the actors uh, in these problematics, they are uh, coming from uh, the, uh, the ecosystem of academy and also um, civic science. Yes, uh, the pandemic has uh, reignited these discussions on public policies of open access of public funded research. And the lack of financial support to access databases is a serious problem for graduates, undergraduates, and civic science uh, initiatives. So that's pretty much the context of uh, our session. And please allow me uh, to read the questions in this role play. Uh, there are five questions. And um, I don't know if it's, uh, I, will, I just will read them uh, to you. Uh, the question number one is uh, how to ensure an open and affordable use of academic databases for scientific innovation without infringing monopolistic and corporate copyright. The second question, how effective are the policies implemented by private and civic society organizations to make free access to academic work, such as Creative Commons? The third question, uh, can forceful po policies by governments or public-private partnerships solve the dilemma between copyleft and copyright? Number four, to what extent do interests of young users, the use of academic databases, for example, students, academicians, influence the policy-making process? And the last question, number five, in the light of the lessons learned from COVID-19 pandemic, can the cases of global emergency be a ground for opening databases? So these are uh, our four uh, or five questions. And uh, each actor uh, in this uh, role play will introduce their interests, answering the policy questions. And I want to invite our first speaker, uh, that represents the private sector. Let me introduce you to Mr. Copia Terry Natael. I hope I pronounce it well. Um, yes, it's well, it's good. It's, it's fine. So, um, yes. Natael, um, Mr. Copia Terry Natael um, is uh, from Burkina Faso, is the founder of uh, Yoman Shop e commerce company. 
and DigiClink Digital Solutions Development Agency. Also is the founder of Digic, the Digic Lab, Marshmallow Project, that's a very nice name, which is a digital project incubator. And, and uh, a little bit more about, um, about DigiClink, um, Digi, Digic, sorry, DigiClink, DigiClink um, has trained more than 2,000 young people in digital entrepreneurship. And um, DigiClab, the Marshmallow Project, Marshmallow Project, which is a digital project incubator continues to work for a better inclusion of digital technology for development uh, of this community in Burkina Faso. Also, yeah, um, Nathaniel has been very proactive and uh, has uh, brought, um, has started to mobilize uh, people uh, from the youth uh, IGF in his country. Thank you, um, uh, everyone, and let's uh, welcome uh, uh, Nath Nathaniel, also Mr. Copia Thierry Nathaniel, to um, to to share with us um, his uh, his points and his interest. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kala Mantra. So, ma, you can hear me? Yes. It's okay. Yes. Okay. My intervention will be done by answering three questions. So the first one is, what policy, uh, what policy is the private sector implement uh, to ensure open access to academic databases? And do I think that uh, they are successful? So, um, a study carried out by the European Commission reveals that just under 40% uh, of company uh, questioned are engaged in the process of sharing data with other companies. Uh, the, the possibility of developing new products or services is the first motivation mentioned by 74% uh, of respondents. 49% mentioned that the possibility of forming partnership with a new player is her motivation. And we have 40% mentioned that the generation of additional income thanks to the monetization of data is her motivation. So you see, uh, you know, the private sector always pursues it, its interest in making more money. So in order to be able to set up a data sharing policy, it will be necessary to have a beneficial arrangement. You know, a private database and university database are most often complementary. So that, uh, that's why data exchange policy are sometimes established. In the event that this complementarity does not work, it's always possible to encourage the private sector to open up this data to exploitation in return for exemption on certain taxes. Uh, also, when these data are used for the research, there are clauses uh, that allow the private sector to, uh, to exploit these data results. All that, there are other traditional policy, but uh, these are the most common and work well. So that is the first point for the first question. So the second question is about, uh, uh, can forceful policy for public-private partnership can solve the dilemma between copyleft and copyright? Or can it put a hug burden on private companies? Uh, I will answer and say that uh, sharing data between public and private actors has been done rather naturally, especially thanks to the digital transformation. 
which has already created a, a, part, a partnership link uh, between the public sector and private sector. It will be uh, understood that data sharing requires more than a framework on, of trust and more than a, a, a governance adept to copyleft and copyright. You know, technology and the legislator can influence sharing data decision between actors, both by constraints and by incentive mechanisms. Example, uh, we have exemption established by the government on certain taxes borne by the private sector. There are also uh, formula of co-exploitation of results following an exchange of data to motivate the private sector to make its data freely accessible. Um, that is the second point for the second question. So the, the last question is, uh, can the private sector uh, open the database in case of pandemic? Okay. In the event of pandemic, uh, everyone is concerned, even if this can be a springboard for some private companies to make more money, it will be wiser to reduce the rights of use of the data in the order to facilitate, to facilitate, facilitate uh, the exit of this crisis. So, uh, Private, uh, priv public and private consultation framework are put in place to promote data exchange. Uh, in in the response, in the response, in response to the unprecedented and rapidly changing uh, circumstances uh, related to the novel coronavirus outbreak, several academic uh, textbook ebook and uh, scholar publisher have temporarily open access to the copyright and otherwise uh, restrictive materials. We don't know when publisher temporarily will offer, uh, will end, but we know that uh, the free access will not be permanent. So as, um, as example, we can uh, we can see um, uh, open uh, resource for the research and clinicians. We can list uh, light COVID. It's a, it's a curated uh, literature hub for taking up that scientific scientific information about the novel COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, as uh, as an uh, example for uh, uh, open source in support of course work and online teaching, we have Cambridge University textbook, press textbook, where we can find more than uh, 700, 700 textbooks. We have Sengage, Sengage for US College experience and planet mid semester impact to the COVID-19. In this platform, we can find more than uh, 40, 14,000 uh, e-books. So we have, we have two university, uh, university of Michigan Press, uh, even open his access. We have open source to open his access, give it freely for exploitation. We have another uh, companies where give uh, freely his access uh, during uh, this pandemic. So that is an example of uh, uh, companies where the private sector companies give uh, freely access to uh, database. So I think that uh, it's uh, the end of the three question uh, that uh, about uh, my my pitch. So 
if you have question, we can speak about it to explain more. Thank you very much, Kalamantra. Thank you very much. Um, you, if you want, you still have two minutes. If you want to add something else. Uh, it's okay. I will waiting for questions to okay. add something. Thank you so much. Now let's welcome um, our next speaker, representing civil society. Mariana Valente from Brazil is director of Internet Lab, a think tank based in Sao Paulo. Working on policy oriented research on internet law and society. She holds a PhD in sociology of law from the University of Sao Paulo and have research experience at LMAU University in Munich, Yale Law School and UC Berkeley School of Law. Welcome. Welcome, Mariana Valente. Thank you so much, Kamala Netra. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's an honor to represent civil society in this discussion. And I thank you very much for this very organized session and for all the attention has been given to us up to now. Um, and I'd like to address some of the points that were addressed to me, but I'll address them as a whole, talking about why civil society should advocate for the opening of academic databases, always, but also especially in the cases uh, of pandemics. Um, and I'd also like to speak a bit on the copyright side of it because there is a discussion going on about uh, copyleft and uh, open licenses when we're talking about um, academic databases, which I think is really important for us to address from a civil society perspective. And there I'm speaking uh, with my role of Creative Commons coordinator in Brazil. So I think it's important to um, uh, to first address uh, free and open licenses. And it's important to stress that they are tools which were created for legally sharing material which is under copyright. And they were, there's a thing going on here, which I don't know <laughs> where it comes from. I hope it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bother you too much in listening to me. So, the creation of these uh, tools, the, the open licenses, it's related to a longer historical development of free software licenses, which by the, their turn are related to specific values around knowledge and creation. When we're speaking of open licenses, uh, Creative Commons licenses are the most well-known known of their expression. Uh, when we're speaking of knowledge and culture, and their creation was based on the experience of the free software movement, but then thinking specifically of uh, these environments uh, and markets which are related to culture and knowledge. Creative Commons licenses, as well as free software licenses, they are based on copyright. And they differ from traditional licenses, which a copyright holder can rent to someone, in the sense that they are public. So their development was related to the development of digital technologies uh, in the sense that digital technologies created a technical infrastructure for sharing. Uh, but even if we have a technical infrastructure for sharing, that doesn't mean that we have a legal infrastructure for sharing. And the open free licenses, they're there to provide that part uh, of the sharing ecosystem. So to publish work under Creative Commons licenses, rights for that must be cleared. So it's extremely important that organizations and whoever is a stakeholder working in the um, uh, open access movement learn about free licensing and have the basic legal tools that enable them uh, to use those licenses and uh, 
place something in the commons, uh, therefore, through these legal tools. I think it's also very important to highlight that academic law knowledge has its own ecosystem of creation and dissemination. When we're speaking of Creative Commons licenses, they apply for all these different ecosystems. Um, sometimes we're speaking of music and film, sometimes we're speaking of educational and academic material, research materials, sometimes we're speaking of databases uh, themselves, sometimes we're speaking of uh, collections of heritage institutions, and we know that when we're speaking of academic knowledge, we're speaking of specific stakeholders uh, that um, work in a certain way, right, have uh, specific roles. It is an area, the area of academic knowledge, in which because of the incentives and how research is funded, wide dissemination is in the best interest not only of the author, but also of the public. And I want to go more into detail in that. Why is that? That's because the author, in this case of academic knowledge, is also the public because researchers and scientists, they deeply need to use academic research in their production too. So open licensing is not only legal, but it's in their interest. Whoever is producing research necessarily needs to have access to prior research. So there's a question on whether authors are ready to open up. And I would say that definitely that this is something that uh, in the open access movement, in the movement that looks into how knowledge is shared in the academia, uh, that is pretty much consensus. Because authors themselves, researchers, they don't profit from research in monetary terms, and their work is in general paid by the universities or research institutes where they work, they profit much from visibility. And of course, they want their work to be seen. That's part of the part of the research and the academic ethos. So that's one thing regarding their work. And the other thing is that that separation between authorship and being a user is uh, not so strict when we're speaking of academic knowledge. So open licensing, it's not only legal because it's based uh, on the copyright uh, it's an infrastructure based on top of copyright. Let's say you use copyright to be able to disseminate and give access through legal tools, but it's also in the interest of authors. So one, another thing that I wanted to highlight is that while licensing is there and it's available and Creative Commons licenses, they've become the pattern for sharing uh, in different uh, academic uh, ecosystems, uh, the CC, the Creative Commons community, has also long learned two important lessons. Of course, you have the licenses and they can be used for disseminating, but when it comes to copyright, you can't go too far without first ensuring limitations and exceptions to copyright. That means uses that are free regardless of open licenses. Um, and also second, mandates. What does that mean? That means that you have to create the incentives and the structures uh, within the ecosystem so that free licenses can be used. And it's very, very important that important universities and research institutions and donors too they have established their own policies regarding how members of those institutions or people who are funded by them uh, publish their work under open licenses. And that's important because you have a whole ecosystem of incentives for publishing and you need to revert a few incentives to make it so that authors publish open license, open licensed. And that's because if all the incentives are for authors to publish under copyright, for example, if all the high rated journals that are going to give them um, high rankings uh, in their careers are under 
copyright and not open licenses, uh, it's very possible that they're going to prefer publishing um, under copyright and not open licenses because of how the incentive system works, even if it would be in their interest uh, to publish and have visibility and uh, have their work widely shared. Uh, because in the short term, they might uh, need uh, specific um, rankings that come from uh, which journals they publish in. So what I, what I want to say is those mandates are really important for creating those incentives and changing the ecosystem. Um, so these are two areas, uh, limitations and exceptions, that is free uses and mandates in which institutions such as universities, but also independent research centers and civil society that cares about access to knowledge should be looking at. Um, I just want to say something before I finish, which is that in this conversation, as uh, has been highlighted here before, uh, we're very often speaking of authors and research and thinking of universities or think tanks. Uh, but when we're speaking of access to science and knowledge, those are not the only stakeholders. We're very frequently speaking of people who are outside the realm of academy, so independent researchers, civic science. Um, and for that, open licensing is even more important. And it's even more important if we're speaking of the global south because of the conditions of access um, to those databases. Um, so open licensing is really important, but besides thinking of mandates, we really have to think of a sustainable infrastructure. We know that knowledge is a global public good and the pandemic has shown us that more than ever, uh, but it doesn't come uh, by itself that knowledge will flow uh, in a way that's fair and in a way that people who need to have access to it will have access to it. So we really need to create the legal, institutional and infrastructural conditions uh, for that to be the case. That's it for now. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana Valente, uh, representing civil society. Thank you for this contribution. Uh, now um, we're moving to um, a third speaker. Oh, no, no, excuse me. We have now a Q&A session of five minutes um, between um, yeah, we have a Q&A session of uh, five minutes uh, regarding the these first uh, two talks, private sector and civil society. Um, Can somebody please um, can somebody please uh, address uh, the questions? I don't I don't know where I find them in the chat. There is a comment in the chat that maybe uh, both our speakers can talk a bit a little bit more. It's not exactly a question. It's not exactly a question, yes, it's like a comment. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting point to be commented. Okay, uh, I'm going read to read it. Our... Yeah, so should I read it? Yeah, sure, thank you. So, so it says, in case of South Korea, there are, there are big company which almost carry out the academic database. They sell them extremely expensive to the library, such as university library. Because of that, lots of library, lots of libraries insisted that is unfair. 
However, their power is too strong to change. So the civil society arc that at least a specific research if expense by public money, such as taxation, should be open source. This is uh, an intervention by Miu Rui Li from, I guess, from South Korea. I uh, do you do you, do Nathaniel or Mariana wants to comment on on this extra or I would definitely and if uh, Thierry also wants to speak um, yeah, I think this is exactly the situation that I was referring to. Um, this is, so different countries have different experiences with their local production um, of academic knowledge. I'm based in Brazil and in Brazil we have a very specific situation that is that we have an open repository that's called Cielo I'll write that in the chat, that is open source. And most of the national um, academic production is open licensed because um, it is indexed in Cielo. And Cielo has been ex an experiment for a few decades and it's become really, really important in Latin America. But we still have that issue of access for very, high prices of, from, li uh, from libraries and universities when we're speaking of production from abroad. And I think you're br bringing a very important uh, experience from South Korea and the specifics of the situation, of course, I don't know, but which re really addresses the issue that I was speaking of um, about mandates. This is something that uh, is being argued by civil society worldwide that when we have research that's publicly funded, that is, it's funded by taxpayers in the end of the day, it's really important that the results of though that research, they're in the public also to be used and to be built upon. We're not speaking of just giving out, right? We're speaking of knowledge that can be built upon. And um, it is the case uh, to really highlight that when we're speaking of publicly funded research. Yes. I don't know if Thierry wants to add and address okay. that too. Okay. Uh, in this case, I think that the civil society must go with the government in order to find a compromise in order to allow access data uh, of this company. So. I, I believe that government can find a way uh, to, to make uh, the data of this company uh, uh, be accessible, maybe not freely, but, but we can, we, they can have it uh, less expensive. So that's my point of view. There are many ways to, to, to find a compromise, many ways, as I told in my pitch. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we are done with the five minutes of Q&A, but we can uh, go um, later. We can also um, ask, I, I guess, during the breakout discussion, they, the people will be able to talk and um, well, no, sorry. Actually, I have a question. Actually, I have a question um, to 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 Nathaniel, to uh, copiatory Nathaniel. Um, could you could you please tell us about uh, more about these uh, subsidies and co-exploitations as a form, uh, as a as a formula from the private sector? Can you come again? I didn't understand it. Could you, could you share a little bit more with us about these subsidies, 
subs subsidize and the co-exploitation uh, from the private sector? Okay, uh, I will I will take an example. So, you know, uh, private sector are always uh, look for a new uh, services or new technology to to increase his business. So uh, they already have a, a database information and, and more data in uh, with them. So that is to uh, give this data to all person want to make a research like academics area in academic area, give them the data freely to find a new technology or to find uh, a new process way. And, uh, and after that, after the results of this uh, using data, uh, the person who make the research can come back and give the result of the research at, uh, to, the, to the private sector company to exploit them to develop his new technology or anything. So that is the co-exploitation uh, uh, ways that are stolen. So it's to uh, bring his data freely to everyone who want to make a research. If the research is, uh, is interest to the company, they, will, they can give a, a data to these uh, persons and tell that, they can exploit data together. Understood, thank you very much. And, and I want to add something. In Africa, uh, during the study of uh, the, 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 the student, they have to make research for the topics, the school uh, ends topics. So they can go to see a private sector a company to have uh, other uh, data. So th this company can give her data and uh, waiting uh, the, the end of uh, the research of this student. When the, the research is, all, all, uh, all is over, they can use this uh, res research results to increase her activity. So that is a question as I was told. Okay. You know, yeah. Okay, so that's like a data mining. Um, okay, so now, uh, thank you so much for that answering that question. And let's move now to our third speaker. Um, the our third, spe our third speaker is Mr. Elnur Karimov from Azerbaijan. He's a regional engagement director of the Internet Society Juice SIG. PhD candidate in private law at Istanbul University. Um, yes, uh, he's the winner of the honor honorary presidential scholarship in Azerbaijan in 2012, and uh, also prizes uh, in 2016 and 2018 for academic excellence. And now is the winner of a renowned Japanese uh, scholarship for research and is doing research in non-traditional trademarks at Kyushu University. Welcome, Elnur. Uh, thank you very much, Kamal Nesra, for a very kind introduction. And thank you very much uh, to my uh, to the organizing team and all the bright speakers for your uh, very valuable comments. Uh, I will try to keep my part short as we have run out uh, the time a bit. Uh, in my part, I will address the two questions. Actually, first one is what what extent the youth are the most active users of the academic database online and to what extent they are involved in the policy making process. What I mean from the youth is actually the university students and the young researchers and academicians. And in the second question, I will address the, the case of pandemic be a ground for opening academic databases to free and affordable access. 
uh, as, as you may all agree, the youth in the 21st century are an underestimated, but still a growing force with the advance of uh, in information communication technologies. And actually, if we, if we look uh, to, the, to the general figures that the youth are really actively using the internet, however, on the other side, they are not uh, actively participating in the policy making process. Uh, how, uh, if we compare with the international and regional and national levels, we can see that, uh, especially during the last years, also thanks to the uh, international forums like the Internet, Internet Governance Forum, the youth are uh, advocating for their rights uh, through, national, uh, through various platforms. However, uh, on the other side, they are really remaining passive at the national level. The youth advisory councils, for example, or the national youth councils or federations in, in respective countries or uh, student unions at the universities are, are just consultative organizations and they do not uh, unfortunately influence the final decisions neither uh, their universities nor their respective count, uh, governments. Uh, I would like to cite a, a report by Rachel Marcus and Alex Cunningham called Young People as Agents and Advocates of Development, published in 20, uh, 2016, which says that the single most common group of activities is young people educating their peers and other community members and this actually education, the peer-to-peer the -peer kind of education has been quite uh, uh, widely accepted among the, among the young people uh, with the advancement of the internet and uh, internet communication technologies. Uh, and, and I'm actually part of the, that kind of uh, organization called Internet Society Youth Special Interest Group, where we are, uh, uh, where we are designing uh, some uh, trainings, webinars to educate the youth and uh, to, to advocate their participation in the internet governance through different platforms. Uh, if we look at the figures at, of the uh, OECD uh, at 2013, it's a report called Education at a Glance. Uh, today, 40% uh, of the young adults are expected to complete university level education over their lifetimes. And only and only 1.6% of young people today are expected to complete advanced research programs. And uh, this, is, this has just increased by 0.6% uh, in comparison with uh, to the year 2000. Uh, on the other hand, the, 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 with the increasing number of young people at the academia, uh, the need for academic databases is also another trend. Uh, if, if we look at uh, one case study in Turkey, I can add the, I can add the paper in the chat later. Uh, the, the academic databases are the second priority among the youth after the search engines, when, when they are uh, doing, when the students are uh, fulfilling their term projects or further research, like the dissertations or the thesis, uh, which proves that without actually the academic databases online today, the university level of education can, uh, can be uh, deteriorated. Uh, on, and if we take into account the fees for the largest academic databases, which is already discussed on the context of South Korea, uh, especially the academic databases that offer eBooks uh, are really and really unaffordable for the youth, even for the youth who receive scholarship from, the, from their government. And, uh, to access these databases, uh, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, has been a great trouble. Uh, I would like to differentiate two kinds of problems the youth face. Uh, the first one is when, uh, when the youth have 
uh, access to the academic databases through their universities. Uh, however, uh, they cannot access through their homes. So the problem here is that some universities, so I will cite my personal experience at Istanbul University in Turkey, uh, they allow, they give uh, free access to their students to, uh, to some of the academic databases. However, uh, you cannot access uh, from your home. You can only use the computers at the library, at the premises of the university, uh, which means that uh, in terms of lockdown, like the pandemic, uh, the, situation, the situation is even harder because you can not only use the books at the, the printed printed materials at the library, uh, but also you are you are deprived of the academic databases because you cannot visit the libraries that the university has been universities have been totally closed. Uh, the second part of the problem, of course, is that even if you have some access to academic databases, they are, the content of these databases can be not rich. And if you want to reach more content, you need to pay more. And the third part is actually, I think it's also the important part, but maybe not related to our session today, is that the literacy level of youth are not enough to use the academic databases. Uh, they do not know how to access, how to use items, of the, uh, how to break the meaningful use of the academic yeah. uh, Thank you very much. Uh, this was my contribution and we will discuss more probably during the next minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Elnor, uh, Elnor Karimov. Um, we still, uh, thank you because you gave us three extra minutes for Q&A. Um, let me see um, questions here in the chat. I think before we should go to the Dr. Moya. Uh, to speak oh to. yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for um, addressing this. Our next ex speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Moya. Uh, Dr. Moya represents uh, the government stakeholder. Uh, Ms. Vivian uh, Moya is from the Philippines, Director, uh, Innovation and Technology Support Office, Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines. Um, she has a major in technology management, a PhD. She is the director of intellectual property and technology business development office of the university since 2012, lots of experience. She managed the innovation technology support office, ITSO, a franchise of intellectual property office of the Philippines. And the technology business incubator, TBI of the university. Welcome, uh, Dr. Moya. Thank the you. The connection so is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our for Kamala Netra. Okay, I will represent. It's an honor to be here to be part of the IGF. Uh, I'm uh, assigned to three questions, and I represent the government. So the first question is how the government should build a balance between the open and affordable use of academic databases and individual rights as authors. Uh, can the a first pol policies by the government solve the dile dilemma of copyright in copyleft? In number three, should the case of pandemic be a ground for opening academic databases for free and affordable access? So today, technological advances has impacted the way data are shared and processed. With modern technology propelling the information age, using a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone with an internet connection, acquiring data and other information are now accessible through online academic databases. Indeed, this technological advances has affected the ways information are shared. The importance on the use of the technology has never been crucial as today when COVID-19 struck worldwide. 
education across the globe shifts from face-to-face -to, -face re to remote and online learning. Academicians, students, creators, and other copyright users are forced to adapt to the online environment. Aside from the lack of technological resources, as most nations have do, many are concerned about the accessibility of academic databases that are needed for quality education. Academic databases, according to Paramol of the University of Liverpool, uh, databases contain some of the most valuable information essential for solving some problems such as climate change, public ele poverty elevation, and many more. The question arises, however, as to what extent do copyright protect academic databases and how can government help make this academic databases afford affordable to researchers and students alike. The, now, the basic principle of copyright is simply simply uh, enshrined in the oldest and the most influential international agreement in the field of copyright, the Bern Convention of 1886. Another more explicit statement of copyright can also be found in Article 2 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty of 1996. In Article 6 of the Agreement on Trips of 1994, which established that copyright protection shall extend to expression and not to ideas, procedures, methods of operation, or mathematical concepts, concepts as such. It could also be stated that the copyright holder decides who can use it, who can change it, and who can share. So according to Ginsburg of 20, in 2011, copyright law has been aimed to protect the creativity of the author offering commercial value for their wares. By affording authors this type of protection, copyright law has been said to promote the advancement by both creativity and profit. This is the dualism of the copyright law, which is actually to advance creativity and at at the same time, commercial value. So in Europe, for example, including Japan and South Korea, academic databases are protected under the so-called sui generis database right, aimed at the protection of investment. Through the Article 7 of the database directive as implemented in the legislation of the member states, the maker of a database showing a substantial investment in either the obtaining or verification or presentation of its contents has exclusive right to prevent the extraction or utilization of the whole or even substantial part that is evaluated qualitatively or quantitatively of the contents of the database. Like copyright protection, the sui generis database right arises automatically without any formal requirement at the time of the completion or disclosure of the database to the public. But in other parts of the world, protection of databases is basically based in two doctrines. The sweet of the brow, a principle to say that copyrights are meant to protect and reward the efforts of an author and that the copyright does not require that an expression be in original or novel form. The other doctrine is the modicum of creativity, a principle which held that the minimum level of creativity is required for it to be protected by copyright. This doctrine further held that facts like, like names, addresses, or etc. are not cop copyrightable, but however, compilation of facts are because the expression by way of the arrangement possesses the least minimum level of creativity. And so academic databases can fall in this principle. Moreover, according to Rusnik, proponents of strong database protection under copyright law argue that it costs a great deal of money to compile, maintain, and service databases. And because of this, private enterprises will have to foot the bill for the upkeep of the state basis and further they argue that an increase of increase in petals to copyright will encourage investment in database development encourage release of licenses for the public and stronger law will would harmony between states 
And so this is the reason academic debates may not be affordable to researchers and students. On the other hand, there is a growing school of thought that holds that intellectual creation should be open for everyone to use, to modify, to redistribute as they see fit, and take legal steps to ensure that others have the right and the opportunity to do so. And this idea, of course, is known as copyleft. So copyleft is not the opposite of copyright, rather it's a way of describing a more liberal copyright. Today, an increasing number of authors or people want to, their work to be freely avail available to the public with or without restrictions, even though the copyright law applies to their work. It grants everyone a license to use and share a work without requiring permission or payment. Uh, usually, it only requires attribution or sometimes the derivative works are to be shared under the same terms as the original. We have discussed the different countries have different criteria for originality, originality and protection, whether this would be literary works or academic academic thesis. So further, copyleft copy or the open access is dominating online and that according to a might undermine scientific peer review. It was even claimed that the increase in posting of manuscript in open access repositories would lead to a wide-scale cancellation of subscription, putting traditional publishers, both commercial and society, in and in the long, resu in long result, erosion and decline of scholarly publishing. However, an, a study conducted by Bjork and Solomon in 2012 showed that open access journals indexed in the web of science and or scopus are approaching the same scientific impact as subscription journals and that open access journals founded in the last 10 years are receiving about this, as many citations as subscription journals launched during the same period. So although the restricting the access to databases limits data sharing and ability of researchers to build previous research and further the knowledge, the same protection provides incentives for research to be carried out where the investment of database is protected. But take note, we are in the new norm. Everything is changing. So can restricting access to database still be effective? So of course, I will leave that question to you. So what is important is that the government together with other stakeholders, civil society, publishers, creators, policy makers, and even research networks should work hand in hand to develop a more organized, efficient, and systematic database sharing system or policy whereby scientific data is shared more effectively, including at the international level. Today, national research networks can also help this made possible. They're usually composed of independent think tanks and experts that are able to provide linkages, inspire, and help improve policy processes. There has been considerable studies proving that these national research networks can help in addressing this change. So as it is the role of the government to ensure the balance between the right of the copyright holder and the public or the users, the government can also encourage authors, publishers, and other repository of knowledge and information to hear the call and step up to provide free or affordable access or academic resources, even at least for the duration of the COVID-19 outbreak. Of course, in return, the government can provide support in terms of grants, funding, loans, ta tax exemptions, or financial scheme that can help our authors who are also affected by this pandemic. The role of the government to ensure that every citizen is accorded with their rights. Between the right of the copyright holders of and the users. The government can also help researchers and scholars alike provide information to a vast of academic databases that are now free and accept accessible to students, teachers, and even librarians, and of course support policies that will encourage accessible and affordable academic databases to our students and researchers. 
So that would be all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moya, for your intervention representing government. I'm asking now to everyone in the public, is there any question to the intervention of the of Dr. Moya representing government or to Elnor Karimov representing the student, the youth sector? Okay. So if there is, please uh, post it. I see at the moment comments, uh, not a specific questions, but there is one question from uh, Juan Pajaro, and it says, uh, this question is to Mariana. Hi, Mariana. What do you think could be a solution for independent investigators in order to get more access? Sometimes that paper that you need, especially in humanities, is restricted, which sound contradictory, but it happens. So he's asking to Mariana, what do you think to be a solution? Yeah. Um, I was trying to also engage in the conversation in the chat. Um, but what I was trying to say is that it's difficult to find a solution that doesn't touch upon the whole ecosystem. Um, because the way it is, um, individual researchers who are not connected to a university that is already paying for the fees of the licenses for academic databases, they basically don't have any means to have access. So we should be investing in open access infrastructures, thinking both technologically and legally. And I agree a lot with what Vivian was saying before. Um, on the roles uh, that governments could play in that. Um, and I was also addressing again the mandates um, and how that has to be thought of in terms of institutional and national policies, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have to go to breakout discussions. There are two rooms. Uh, uh, Please go to your breakout rooms. You can also have coffee during your breakout uh, discussions. And um, there is uh, one group for um, private sector and civil society and another one for youth and government. Um, please, the co-host, could you facilitate this, uh, this split? We need to split in these two groups. Thank you and you have uh, 10 minutes. Um, just to jump in. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Pedro. I'm also uh, the rapporteur of the session. And the rooms will be for the speakers to talk among themselves and reach some uh, common points uh, about the academic database and open access and other topics that we talked here. But while they are having their discussion, we are also opening to participation here in the uh, live session. So people can talk about their experience in their own countries. Uh, for example, uh, someone talked about the, the situation in uh, South Korea, and it would be nice to us to hear about how things work relating to academic databases in uh, other countries or other regions or even local initiatives. Um, please, if you want to, to talk, just write in the chat or uh, raise your hand. There is a tool for that. And we can open the microphone so you can speak. If you prefer, you can also write in the chat and I will read it for you.
just uh, just to break the ice uh, with some, uh, just to start the discussion with an example here from Brazil as well. We have an initiative that uh, research that was made in public universities, which are the most, usually the most important ones here in Brazil. Uh, some of these universities have to publish their uh, the research, uh, the works that are, are published in their magazines. Some universities have their own magazine. They have to do it on open access. So it's a way to contribute with the society since they have public funding and uh, other kinds of public support to de develop their own academic activities. They also have to give back to the society uh, in the format of this open source, open access uh, journals, and even open access uh, research papers or dissertations, doctoral theses, et cetera, et cetera. If anyone wants to jump in, please, yes, let us know. Oh, Aileen. Aileen Sages just raised her hand. Can you please unmute her? Uh, Okay, support. thank you. Very thank nice. you very much, Pedro. Um, I have a question. I'm looking at the last comments at the chat. Uh, so one of the suggestions is um, making these publications uh, public for free. Uh, so if we can imagine a scenario that all the publications uh, would be free, so what would happen if that uh, public... Um, how to say a database of publications. Uh, it's under the domain of a government and the government is saying, okay, I don't want this specific publication to be shared because it doesn't share, I don't know, the same values or the things that they don't want to share. Uh, what do you think it could be, it could happen in that situation? Uh, we could have a model that it's, uh, that the all the publications can be free and accessible or it will be like too extreme. I, I hope it's understandable my question. Elin, sorry, I think my internet connection failed for a bit. Could you just repeat uh, the question? I got the first part of the, the what you said, but just just didn't get the, the last section. Okay. Um, okay, I, I that wasn't prepared, so I'm trying to gather my thoughts again. So I was uh, thinking about an imaginary uh, scenario that we will have that all the publications are under a public fund uh, for free. Uh, but that, uh, what could happen if this uh, public database of publication, it's under the domain of a government and the government is saying, okay, I don't want this a specific publication to be to the access uh, to the people. In that case, we should uh, think of, um, of a public uh, database, uh, Totally, or or do you think maybe another approach? That's my my worry. Oh, this is a great question. I I think that the best way to develop this public uh, database is not through uh, direct control by uh, the political aspect of the government. I mean, the executive branch, the le legislative branch but through the education parts, maybe uh, universities mainly, um, that have that are a little more, a bit more independent than this political interests that are natural and a common part of government action. So even though, but even if the public databases are under direct control of the government or even indirect control such as government that can 
uh, give orders to universities. Even in that case, at least in Brazil, we have some uh, constitutional uh, rights or even civil rights that get guarantee the this aspect of not censoring uh, manifestations, mainly academic manifestations. So uh, one could use them, could go to uh, to the courts to guarantee their publications, their opinions, uh, such as freedom of speech and uh, and freedom of information in some countries. I think it's, of course, it's not something that we can be totally sure that will happen, but it's a constant tr struggle to keep up the freedom of speech and freedom of information as it is in all other aspects of copyright. I think they are coming back in just a few minutes and we can get their, their common points and finish, finish the session. So at this moment, there are two groups uh, in breakout rooms, private sector together with civil society and youth and government. Uh, let's give them um, about five minutes more, I would say. And uh, then when they send me the comments, um, I will try to, to, to communicate with you the output. While they are sending the outputs, um, some interesting points were raised in the chat. I will just read them aloud so they are registered in our video. Um, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Georgiana Petrova sent us the European Union regulation guidelines to the rules on open access to scientific publication and open access to research data in Horizon 2020. Uh, it shows the European Union position on, uh, on this question, talking uh, such as the Brazilian example that I gave, the avail availability of uh, research that was partially or purely funded by public resources. Uh, Ruth Moulton talked about uh, how the internet itself owes much of its success to the fact that the research papers and protocols were published pub, published in uh, RFCs, which are on the public domain, freely available. And uh, Veronica Piccolo highlighted the importance of open source to give visibility to authors and contents.
there are some there were some older uh, comments too that maybe it's nice to mention. Shadrach uh, mentioned that one of the solutions to what open source academic database are the national research and education networks who uh, that try to connect university networks to share free academic resources. Um, Veronica mentioned that some universities provide VPN access uh, even from home to get access to academic database. And Rima Kupriti uh, remember that some institutions do not have either the skills or infrastructure to set up VPN or easy proxy, which results in some problems to the students and also to liber uh, libraries that cannot provide remote access to licensed re e resources. Uh, hello, Pedro and everyone. Hello, Elnor. Hello, Commander Cha. Uh, do you think we will have time to present or? Yes, please go, please start if you want okay. to start okay so uh we we have discussed with the private sector Mr. about uh, three main points and i would say that we reached the uh, agreement uh, the first point is that uh, database publishers can offer open access to smaller researcher groups of the society from whose the research, from whose research, the company can also benefit. This is made to uh, limited to some uh, disciplines where the companies will be interested to kind of open their access and uh, invest the uh, Second point was that uh, instead of the university administration student unions can be an intermediary between the students and database publishers in the negotiations for open or affordable access. So we, we agreed uh, that the university administration can uh, push some uh, bureaucracy in the negotiations and maybe the student unions can better uh, represent the interest of students in the negotiations, and they can be a third party in the in the, in the to get an access. And third third point, last point we uh, noted was that the as soon as it, this re, this is related to the exchange of data, and we, we agreed that uh, if the universities can create their own databases based on their collections of the printed books in the libraries. So with what we mean is that online academic databases, the database publishers can exchange the resources with them and they can actually enrich uh, the, the academic databases of each other. Uh, and in, in this collaboration, actually the, the people who will benefit will be the students because they will have the the rich academic databases of their universities and the database from the database publishers. Yeah, that's it from our side. And let's hear maybe from the other side. Hi. Uh... Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Anur, for sharing the output. Now, Mariana, um, that was Elnur sharing the output of the student and the corporate uh, discussion. And now uh, Mariana is gonna share with us the output discussion of civil society and government, please. Okay. Uh, Vivian, can you hear me? Hello, she froze here. Too. No, she's there. Would you like to start? Maybe I can complete. I think your connection would be better, Mr. Mayer. Yeah. 
okay we had agreed on on that but i don't think she can hear us very well so um government and civil society right um uh, we were in agreement almost most of the time but it was not as easy to find what the solutions would be and we were discussing different settings in different countries and how uh, the academic ecosystem works uh, in these different places what we agreed on and i think that's very important already is that publicly funded research should be open and free um, it should be uh, made available to whomever wants to have access to it uh, in different countries but then vivian was sharing that um, it's very common that freely available uh, research will not be peer-reviewed so we were for some time discussing that we would also have to think of solutions for having peer-reviewed research uh, published um, as open access and what government policies could be in place for that. Um, we were discussing that some organizations have the capacity to do that uh, because it's in their mandates, it's in their, their missions, uh, and it can be also that government can fund uh, initiatives and journals that are peer-reviewed uh, and uh, that are also published open license, but we didn't reach more conclusions than that. I don't know if we even can add. I agree with the uh... I think the solution was to really come up with a policy on that uh, to encourage publishing on an open access license that uh, this paper should be peer reviewed even if it's an open license, open access license. Um, uh, the difference that subscription are pre subscription based licenses are preferred because uh, they are claiming that it's more credible because they are peer reviewed. But if you make open access also peer reviewed, then that would make open access license also credible for. the policy we can do that if we we can do we cannot do that alone of course as a civil society or as a government and we should work hand in hand together with other organizations or other institutions that has the capability of pursuing these policies or supporting at least these policies thank you thank you so much thank you so much uh, uh, we have just a few minutes to uh, summarize the main output. So SDG number four, SDG number nine, we are having a problem of access and uh, equality in education and also infrastructure. Regarding that, uh, there have been some points in the two groups. The first group was a discussion of the youth together with the corporate. And there were three main things. Database publishers can offer open access to a smaller research group of the society for whose research the database companies can also benefit. Number two, the students' unions can be an intermediary between the students and database publishers in the negotiations for open and affordable access. Rather than contact with the university administration. And number three, uh, as soon as the universities create their own databases, this is, we are talking about uh, new infrastructure, creating their own databases with the collections of the available books 
the database publisher can exchange the resources or they can provide open access to each other from which the students will benefit. So that's it's the main output from this discussion and the discussion between Mariana Valente and Dr. Moya, which was a civil society and government, uh, is that the conclusion that they agree was that publicly funded research must be free. That was the, the main uh, conclusion. Um, so, um, yes, we are in a time of Corona and um, so status, the status quo is leaving many underprivileged people behind, like students and people from civil society, especially people in rural areas. And uh, humanity in these times of pandemic, like COVID, must be uh, united, you know? And, um, and we are in the same board and people are vulnerable, but these kind of situations also show solidarity for people to find solutions. And uh, there has been um, in the uh, sort of common points in sort of resolution agreements um, that these four points that uh, we, um, that I mentioned, and um, we will share this in a, in a document uh, uh, together, uh, the, the organizers of this session about this output. So I think uh, I want to thank you to all the speakers for your presentations and the invitation to this, um, to this session. And please do not forget who are you serving and, uh, and do not stop uh, sharing. Do not stop sharing and do not stop serving your communities. And uh, I want to welcome, um, yeah, to welcome you all to continue um, yeah, investing your energy and your love into this. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone wants to add something, you please get the microphone. You are welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Have a nice day or a nice night, depending on where you are. Thank you, everyone. Just uh, remember that we, you, all of us will be requested to give feedback after, after the session. So please get give us a feedback. We'd, we'd really appreciate that will help us make a report and also draft the next IGF. Thank you so much and feel most welcome. feedback for